Today we're going to continue looking at the Babylonian kingdom. Uh, what kind of people made up the Babylonian kingdom? Or the, the ones who were in control of the Babylonian kingdom? Which tribe of people were kind? And those were the old Babylonians. Those the old Babylonian people were Amorites. Who were these guys? Chaldeans. And uh, who was the the main person that we, we look at so far is a king of Babylon, the emperor of the Babylonian Empire. Nebuchadnezzar. Right, Nebuchadnezzar. All right, so we want to look next at the uh, great city that was ancient Babylon. Now, Babylon, of course, is located here in the area between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. What is that area called? Between the rivers? Mesopotamia. Right, Mesopotamia. The first civilization that we studied was down in this area. What was that called? Uh, what's the first two letters? I'm not sure what you're saying. Uh, Sumeria. Like Sumer. 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 Yeah. See, I was very close to Sumeria, which is S A. Sumer. Uh, that's what we call it. Uh, so uh, here's Babylon. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is the king. His father was king before him. And Nebuchadnezzar has traveled over this way, come down to uh, Jerusalem, chasing after Necho, the pharaoh of Egypt. Uh, and we've seen that he has uh, taken the city and taken captives back to Babylon. So let's uh, take a look at what Babylon was like. I have some drawings here that somebody has made based on what was written about it that, that may give us an idea of how it looked, uh, the splendor that was Babylon. It was a, a wonder uh, of that world with its double walls. Uh, you can see the double walls here. It has a moat around it. It had 100 bronze-plated gates with iron bars. It was a planned city. You know, it just didn't grow up like people building here and there. They planned it out. And that's why, you, if you look at this, you see the, the streets are straight. Uh, everything's planned out, especially uh, on the border with the, the walls. Uh, it was divided by the Euphrates River. The Euphrates River uh, ran through the city. And uh, I'm not sure whether that's the river back here or not. It's kind of hard to tell whether that's the river. This is the moat around it, but there's a river that flows through the city. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the city had, uh, of course, bridges across the Euphrates River, as well as a subway uh, connecting the different parts of the city. Uh, they didn't have trains in the subway, but it just had a, a subterranean street, if you might, if you might call it a tunnel. <laughs> So here we see a uh, bridge across. Now this this may be, now this is the, these are the walls. So that's got to be the outside of Babylon. This is a bridge going into it. Uh, and this looks like streets back here. I'm not sure where the river is. On this. Uh, here's one of the gates. Uh, this is uh, a photograph. This is not simply a drawing. This is called the Ishtar Gate. Uh, this is something that's been found and uh, displayed. Uh, this is what it looks like presently, uh, and that's all that's left. The walls are not there anymore. Uh, here's what it would have looked like in, in place. So you can see how it fits into uh, the landscape of the other buildings. So here's the Ishtar Gate and the people going through it. You can see it's a really large thing. Here's a, uh, a close-up picture of the gate as uh, it is in the museum. And you can see all the different figures that are on the gate. Here's a close up of a lion. And what is that? A lion. A lion, yeah. Now, this is uh, not just drawn on the, the brick, this is 3D. These, this is coming out from the brick. So it was constructed in such a way that. Um, it has depth to it. So we have a lion, and um, what does that look like? 
An elk. Have what you ever seen an elk? <laughs> no. A horse? Uh, I think the the head and so on, the tail back here looks more like a goat, I think. You think? It's kind of like a goat. What's this? <coughs> exactly. Uh, there, there's no creature today that we know of that fits that description. Uh, so we might term it a dragon. Uh, notice the feet. Uh, I think I think if we could look closer at that, you would see claws on the feet. Uh, the uh, body. Look, see it. It kind of has scales on it. You see? Can you see the scales there? And a long head up here, a long tail. So that looks like uh, maybe it's some kind of a reptile. And the question is, and people look at that and say, oh, they, they put uh, a mythological creature on the gate. Well, were the other creatures on there mythological, or were they real? They were real. So why, what reason is to think that this wasn't real to them as well? Here's another picture of a model of the gate and the walls around it. Uh, one of the things that um, the Babylonians seemed to have selling was in the area of medicine. They, uh, this is a painting of a pharmacy in Babylon, so they're mixing up the different drugs to give this sick man. And here's just a, a drawing showing where Babylon is in, uh, geographically. Uh, here's a model of the city. Uh, here's the god Marduk and Enul, Ishtar, all pictured in different ways. And these are symbols of different gods. God Sin, Shamash, Ishtar. Uh, this is a ziggurat, uh, which would have been used uh, in in the form of a temple. This is where worship took place of Marduk. He had walked the ramp, and uh, eventually those who the priests make it up to the top. There are steps going this way. There he is within a model of Babylon. So you can see how big it is compared uh, to the city walls, which were very large too. Uh, this is out of a, a book, a picture of a book that I have uh, showing what it may have been like for people going to this temple in Babylon. Now, Nebuchadnezzar was the king under which Babylon reached its zenith, its high point. Uh, he was a vigorous and brilliant commander and the greatest man of his time in the non Jewish world. He was a soldier, a statesman, and an architect. He married a Median princess, a princess from the area of the Medes, whose name was Amahia, and he built for her the famous Hanging Gardens of Babylon, pictured here. Uh, this is the, the most wonderful picture uh, drawing that anyone that I, I've seen. Now, I've, I've seen a lot of drawings that people have made, but this one just looks uh, very attractive. Uh, he built that because uh, his wife, being from the land of the Medes, was used to being in the forests of the mountainous areas in which she lived. And in Babylon, they did not have that. So he built a replica of a mountainous area with all kinds of uh, waterfalls and trees and plants uh, to make her feel at home called the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. It was considered by the Greeks to be the seventh wonder of the ancient world. Now, you can imagine with all the abilities that he had, all the areas that he had conquered, uh, the accolades he received for building something like this caused him to be, be, feel very proud of himself. And he did just that. And that pride rose in him to the point where he states that he is uh, so great because he has done all these things. 
but God brought judgment upon him and made him crazy for seven years. So for seven years, he lived like an animal out in the fields. His fingernails kept growing, his beard and his hair kept growing. He was living like an animal until he was willing to acknowledge that God is the one who gave him all those things. God was the one who was the supreme being, not him. Uh, he had someone help him along that way. Uh, with that in Daniel, but uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar learned his lesson, I believe, and came to believe in the one true God. Now, the, the Babylonians uh, left the internal rule of Judah in the hands of Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, who ruled from Mesbah. So, uh, you don't even know all of that, or even Gedaliah, uh, but just to know that the Babylonians usually allowed someone of the area to rule in that area. So let's uh, think back a little bit about where we have come from and, uh, and we'll see where we are. So remember we started with Abraham entering Canaan. He came originally from where? Ur. Ur. Uh, Jacob, the uh, grandson of Abraham, moves his family to Egypt following who? What? Yeah. Joseph. Uh, 400 years later, they are have been enslaved. Uh, and uh, Moses is sent by God to lead them out of Egypt, called the Exodus. He uh, takes them where? Where do they go to get the uh, Ten Commandments? Mount mm -hmm. Sinai. They eventually make it to the Promised Land, the land of Canaan. Uh, Moses dies. Joshua takes them in. The first city to fall was Jericho. After Joshua died, we have a period of time where there is no leader in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes which we call the period of the judges. Following that, uh, who has made the first king? Saul. Uh, Saul is disobedient. The kingdom is taken away from him. And, and uh, God anoints whom as the next king? Internet just returned. That was Barlow Girl. I'm glad it was something good. Uh, so, David becomes king, and then who becomes king after David? Solomon. And when he dies, the kingdom is divided over what issue? Tax. Taxes. Why well, have you missed that on the quiz? Taxes. The northern kingdom was called what? Israel. Israel, the southern kingdom. Israel. Who was the king of the northern kingdom? Jeroboam. Jeroboam. The king of the southern kingdom, who was the son of Rehoboam. Solomon, Rehoboam. The uh, capital of the northern kingdom, Samaria. Samaria. The capital of the southern kingdom of Judah, Jerusalem. Jerusalem. All right. Uh, eventually, uh, well, uh, Jerusalem falls because they have continually one evil king after another. They fall into idolatry, and uh, they are defeated by or captured by what nation? Israel is captured by whom? So we just had a quiz over Assyria. yesterday. How soon you forget? Assyria. Uh, and then we find that uh, Judah has also been disobedient, not quite as much. Not, uh, they kind of go back and forth, but eventually God sends Babylon to invade them and uh, carries many of them away. Uh, we have the fall of Judah then occurring in 586 with the destruction of the temple, which you wrote about for today. All right, and I will uh, check that at the uh, end of the period to see that you have read that. All right, so get a liar was uh, given control over uh, Jerusalem, but he was murdered by a bunch of hotheads, essentially, that uh, got rid of him. But uh, out of fear that Babylon was going to come and uh, attack because of what happened to Gedaliah, many Jewish families fled and went down to Egypt. Uh, here they founded Jewish military colonies, which are known through Persian archives of the period. So 
we know from outside of the Bible. In Judah, the land and destroyed settlements were quickly occupied by Jews who were left in the land. In other words, when Babylon uh, took away a lot of the, the people, the families here back to Babylon, those who were left kind of took over the land that was left behind. They kind of, they, they were a bit greedy, uh, took over the land as their own. And that caused a lot of resentment among the captive exiles back in Babylon when they heard that their land had been taken over by other people, sometimes their own relatives. But, you know, they said, no, that's my land. You know, you don't be taking that. Uh, the central highlands of Judah, however, were not pre reoccupied. And uh, the Babylonians did not bring settlers in like the Assyrians had done to Israel. Uh, these areas were gradually seized by the Edomites, who, the, who live in Edomia. At this time now, they begin to call it Edomians rather than Edomites. So they come up, uh, they're down in this area, and they come up and start taking over parts of Judah. Uh, the southern Judean hills. Uh, now becomes known as Edomia. Most of the exiles in Babylon who were settled in scattered agricultural communities preserved their spiritual and religious heritage and cultivated the vision of the return to the promised land. So they kept thinking and, and studying and, and uh, hoping for a time when they would return to the promised land, to the land of Judah. This found expression in uh, the visions of Ezekiel, who was exiled to Babylon along with Jehoiachin, remember the, the last king who was occupying there before the Babylonians took it. In chapters 47 and 48 of Ezekiel appear his view of the redistribution of the Holy Land among the 12 tribes during the Millennial Kingdom. Now while they're in Babylon, the uh, Oh, uh, before we get to that, uh, we have at this time uh, a, an event occur that, that almost every uh, child who goes to Sunday school knows, and that's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, you know the situation. I'm sure you've uh, heard this, this about this event. You've read about it. Uh, they refused to bow down to a statue that Nebuchadnezzar had made of himself. This is before his going crazy periods when he returns to the Lord. And so he has the three of them bound and thrown into this furnace that was so hot that the people throwing them in died. Uh, and yet, what did he see when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace? John? He saw four people doing what? Burning up? Yeah, they're standing there, walking around. He says, and then he says to one of the other guys, didn't we throw three people in there? And, and, and not only are they not bringing up, they're walking around, and but there's four. And do you remember how he describes the fourth person? He says, it looks like the Son of God. Or he may have said a Son of the Gods, but that's as close as he could come. He knew it was supernatural. Uh, and so he calls for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to come out, and they come out of the furnace, and not only are they not burned, they don't even smell like smoke. Their clothes are not singed, no smell of smoke about them. So there are a lot of things that happen in the book of Daniel that we're not going to get into that, that talk about what takes place during this time when Nebuchadnezzar is king. Now, in addition, there are developments that take place among the Jewish people that are there. By the way, I think I've told you before, but let me reiterate, this is where we get the word Jew. It's from the tribe of Judah being taken into captivity in Babylon. So if we use the word Jew for any time before this, that really is not correct. It's only those that were taken to Babylon from Judah, and they're called Jews then. So uh, the Jews develop a, uh, a system by which they can continue to worship God, because remember what has happened. The temple is gone. The temple has been destroyed. That was the focus of everything they did in a, in a spiritual way. That was their focus of worship, was going to the temple. Offering sacrifices. Now what are they going to do? You see the, the problem? Now you put yourself in their place. Now what are we going to do? There's no temple. Even if there was, we couldn't get there probably, but there is no temple. 
So how are we going to worship God now without all that? So they come up with uh, some things, and uh, we see some developments that occur in Judaism during this time period, uh, mostly of a good nature. First of all, from this point on, we have no more idolatry. You know how periodically the people of uh, Israel and Judah both would start worshiping idols? That never happens again at least from the standpoint of physical idols, like Baal. You could make a case that by the time of Jesus, they're worshiping an idol and that they're worshiping their own righteousness or they're worshiping money, things like that. You, you could say that, even worshiping the temple in a way. But they don't worship out-and-out -out idols ever again after this. Secondly, they give, since they have no temple, they give all their attention to the law. They, they feel that studying the law has to take the place of everything that they've been doing before. It's of prime importance. And in order to uh, do that effectively, they not only have the five books of Moses, but now they have other books too, and they have to look at those and say, should those be considered part of Scripture? And they come to the conclusion that yes, uh, a lot of these Writing should be a part of Scripture, recognized as part of the Word of God. And so we have the formation of the canon during this time, especially through uh, Ezra, who we'll come to. And one of the most important things that develops is the synagogue system. Uh, we've talked about synagogues before, I think, uh, if not in this class, uh, uh, in Bible class. But uh, what is a synagogue? Uh, what, what, what's the purpose of a synagogue, John? Right, it's a place to worship God, and, and particularly to a place to teach the law, to teach God's word. They knew that we've got no temple to go to anymore, so how are we going to make sure our, our children know God and know his word? Well, they established a synagogue system. In order to have a synagogue, a meeting place for Jewish people, you had to have at least 10 Jewish males. If you had 10 Jewish males, then you could have a synagogue and meet together. And there would be uh, people in charge of uh, reading the law, teaching the law. That's where school would take place for children to teach them God's word throughout the week, teach them to read, and so on. All right, so the synagogue system started. Now, the significant thing is that when we get to the New Testament times, we get to the Gospels, we find that the synagogues are a very important part of what happens in the Gospels. We find Jesus going to the synagogue often. So even when a temple was built again in Jerusalem, they kept the synagogue system. It seemed to be something that really worked to keep the people uh, in God's Word and having them be knowledgeable about God's Word. Uh, maybe more so than uh, the temple by itself ever had. And so we find Jesus goes to the synagogue. We find that when uh, Saul of Tarsus begins his missionary journeys, that he goes first place every time he goes somewhere is to a synagogue, right? Because that's where Jewish people are that are expecting Messiah. So the synagogues become a very important part of what we call Judaism, which is the word we can apply to the Jewish faith or religion following the Babylonian exile. Uh, There's some additional non-biblical practices that began during this time period. Uh, they began as memorials and then they became obligatory by rabbinic decree. Uh, the first is called the Fast of the Tenth of Tevet, or Tevet. Uh, and that's because that was the day that uh, Jerusalem uh, was besieged, or, or during that month was when Jerusalem was besieged. So, uh, and that would be equivalent to our January. They would fast during that month to remember how Jerusalem was laid siege to by Babylon. Uh, the second one's called the Fast of the 17th of Tammuz, which is around our July. That's when Jerusalem was captured. And so they had a fast that day to remember that. Next was the fast of the 9th of Av, which is in August. That's the day that Jerusalem was destroyed. So they fasted that day to remember what had happened. And then there's the fast of Gedaliah. Uh, and that goes back to the governor that I just mentioned a little while ago who was assassinated. So they had a fast to I remember that. He was assassinated by a guy by the name of Ishmael. 
So these are different things that came out of their time in Babylon. And what was the purpose? The purpose was to remember. You know, we do things to remember. We have Memorial Day to remember all those that have served in the armed forces that have died <clears throat> in our wars. Uh, we have the uh, Independence Day celebration to remember the beginnings of our country. You know, we have Thanksgiving to remember uh, what God has done for us and also to remember the, uh, uh, the pilgrims as they celebrated uh, their first year here in America. You know, over and over again, we have days of remembrance also. But they wanted to remember the bad. They wanted to remember Jerusalem being besieged, Jerusalem falling, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. They wanted to remember those things, the bad things in their past. They wanted to make sure that they never forgot. <coughs> so we think about Judaism. There are a number of things that we associate. As I said, they never fall into idolatry again. It becomes a religion of law, so they revere the law of God. There's an emphasis on reading the scrolls, which have God's law. The, the priests can't offer sacrifices anymore, so they become community leaders. They become people that are just helping uh, those that are around and trying to develop uh, camaraderie in the community. And this comes about as a process from the religion of the Hebrews. Uh, Ezra is largely responsible for implementing some of these things, but it comes about as a result of the fact that there's no more temple. And then the, we, we call that religion then Judaism. And, and that's essentially what we have uh, today. Uh, we'll talk about that later on, how it gets to where we are. All right, any questions? All right, next I want to check the reading of the article Destruction of the First Temple, and then you can use the rest of the time to work on the assignment, which is to fill in the chart that you have in your notes, which shows a comparison of Daniel's dream and Nebuchadnezzar's dream. You see that in your notes? I want you to fill in everything except the interpretation. I'll give you the interpretation. But fill in the other parts of it from looking at Daniel's Daniel chapters two and seven. All right. Any questions about the assignment? You see it there. And fill in that chart. All right. I'm going to come around and uh, check your reading of the article, and uh, you can begin working as I do that. 